Uh, today we're looking at a story, I, I think it's one of the most beautifully told stories in the whole of the New Testament uh, that we heard read. Uh, it's the story about these two, two disciples of Jesus who are coming to terms with this strange reality of Jesus' resurrection from the dead. Uh, but before we dive into the story, as I sometimes do, I want to kind of prepare the ground to give us a, a framework for how to even think about what's happening in this story. Um, and to do that, I want to show uh, you a picture. And it's, it's a picture you've probably seen before. Actually, my hunch is that most of you have seen this picture before. Um, it's an oil painting that's one of the most famous paintings of Jesus ever in history. Do you guys, have you guys seen this painting before? So 1941 by a, a, a painter called Warner Salman. You may not have known that. This is the pre-World War II painting. Um, this painting, you guys, this painting of Jesus is the most mass reproduced image of Jesus in human history. Uh, there have been over 500 million prints of this painting, uh, if you include calendars and lampshades and magnets. <laughs> 500 million. It's the most reproduced image of Jesus in Christian history, in world history. This one right here. And it's not, I mean, look, it's, you know, 1941. It's not even that old in terms of how long Christianity has been around. Um, and it's, uh, you can just see, it's very captivating, right? Jesus is depicted here. He's very serene. He's, uh, he's simple. Um, he's staring at something. Right? So uh, there's kind of like a mystery, but a purpose to him. There you go. It's the head of Christ, Warner Solomon's head of Christ. 500 million of these floating around planet Earth. Um, now here's what's interesting is, you know, every, every image or representation of Jesus has a story underneath it. It also has a whole usually unexamined series of assumptions driving it. Um, if you grew up with this image, which maybe some, some of you have, um, this image sh shapes how you think about Jesus in, in probably more ways than we could ever realize. Um, there's one really outstanding feature of this painting um, that would be obvious to somebody 2,000 years ago, right? Uh, and the, anyone? It's the fact that Jesus is a, is a white European-looking man, you know, <laughs> that's with impeccable hair, right? Um, he's not too far from a mullet. I don't know if you could just shorten the top and then he's going for it. Anyhow, yeah, so very, very clearly, Jesus is a w white, handsome, beautiful European-looking man, right? Are you with me? It's just clear, clear as day. It might not be clear as day to you, depending on the culture you've grown up in, so here's what's fascinating. Um, in 2002, there was a group of British New Testament scholars, and they teamed up with uh, a, a group of forensic scientists, and they did this tour all around Jerusalem and the regions around, and they um, got access to all of the skeletons and skulls f found in tombs in and around Jerusalem dating to the time of Jesus, and they did these 3D scans of all the skulls, which you might think is kind of gross. But here's what they wanted to do. They wanted to get what is the average-looking skull of a Jewish man from the time of Jesus. And then they let the forensic scientists, you guys see in forensic scientists how they can, you know, if they find like a corpse in a river and they need to re-piece together, who was this person? They can do these things. Do you know that this is possible in the world today? So uh, do you get where this is going? So they're like, well, okay, let's reconstruct the face of an average Jewish man from the first century, and will at least be closer to the face of Jesus than Warner Solomon's head of Christ. And so here you go. You can, there you go. Now, I'm not saying that's Jesus, but are the odds much, much better that Jesus looked something more like this than Warner Solomon's head of Christ? What are the odds? The odds are much higher that Jesus uh, was mid five foot, Average male skeleton, Jewish man in the first century, was mid five feet, five six, average. And uh, coarse, coarse black hair, much larger nose than Warner Solomon's head of Christ. There you go. 
Now, not by a raise of hands, but I just want you to ask you, would you put this picture up in your living room? <laughs> and if not, why? If, really think about this. If, if you're happy to have Warner Solomon's head of Christ hanging somewhere in your house, um, why is it that a less handsome Jesus is, is less appealing to you? To have hanging out, it's Jesus. <laughs> Right? If I'm a follower of Jesus, it, it makes all the sense in the world to have some representation of him in my house. Why not have one that's m almost certainly more accurate? What's going on there? Are you with me? And what this raises is a whole, it's very interesting. It, it raises this age-old truth ab about how we perceive people. That the way that you and I perceive someone's appearance drives and shapes our assumptions about them, doesn't it? And so there are many people, at least 500 million, uh, who are much more comfortable with white European Jesus, handsome Jesus, represented in their home than not. And that just speaks to something about the human condition, about how we perceive each other and how we perceive people. And these images of Jesus, I think, highlight it in, in a different way, that, that somehow we... We need to recognize, and this is true of every disciple of Jesus, as we're going to see from the very beginning, that we come to Jesus with preloaded assumptions and preconceptions about who he is and what his story is and what he's all about. And the Warner Solomon's head of Christ shows that perfectly. And so I don't know what you thought when you first saw this almost certainly more accurate representation of, of what Jesus' face or complexion was. But there's, there's a humbling that must take place. Because if, if we don't allow who Jesus actually is to challenge our assumptions about him, there's a truth that this story shows us that, that we actually will remain blind to who he is. We can be a Christian. We can go to church. We can read the Bible. Somebody can do that for years and remain totally blind to who Jesus actually is. And so what this story, what these images raise for us is what does it take to have the blinders removed uh, so that my assumptions about Jesus get brought out into the spotlight and shown for what they truly are. And it's exactly what this story here in Luke 24, uh, the cross and the resurrection, if you let them sink in to your mind and heart, will shatter everything you thought you knew about Jesus and, and about ourselves. This week, we're looking at uh, Luke's account of the resurrection appearance of Jesus. So Jesus, in Luke's story, has been executed. Uh, the empty tomb has already happened in the story right before this. So uh, a number of uh, women disciples of Jesus, and then Peter goes to the tomb. He's nowhere to be found, and there's these mysterious people at the tomb saying that Jesus is alive from the dead. And then we're introduced to two of them. Two of the larger crew of hundreds of disciples that were there. And uh, they're going away from Jerusalem. Where are they on their way to? A town called Emmaus. Just tuck that away. It's extremely important. A village called Emmaus. It's a, it's a number of miles, about a day's journey from Jerusalem. And what are they talking about on the way? Well, what would you be talking about? <laughs> so you uh, just sold half your possessions and spent the last year and a half following this guy around, Jesus of Nazareth. And you thought he was the real deal. You know, you thought he was the Messiah and you went with him, went out to Jerusalem for Passover, the most important religious political holiday of the year for the Jewish people. And you thought it was all going to hit the fan and everything was going to go down. And Jesus said the kingdom of God was right here at the door, and he was coming to bring it. And then you go to Jerusalem, and what happens to Jesus? He gets arrested, and he gets brutally crucified by the Romans. And this didn't fit any of your categories for what was supposed to happen here. And so a number of them, then it gets even more weird because then some of the other disciples are like, yeah, well, the tomb's empty now and it's all very strange. And two of them are just, I'm over this. <laughs> and they pack up, they're going back home. 
They're not going to stay in Jerusalem. They're, they're leaving and they're going back home. Are you with me? So the, the, the fact that Jesus, and we'll see this exactly in what they say, Jesus' death was a shattering tragedy for, for most of the disciples. It did not make sense. Even though Jesus had been trying to communicate to them that it's what was going to happen, they'd had such a different story in their heads. About, they had a set of driving assumptions about who Jesus is and what he was going to Jerusalem to do, that when he ended up on the cross, it just, everything, everything fell apart. And so we have two of them. And as they walk along, talking about all of this, about their shattered hopes, who appears walking next to them? Jesus. And this, become, this is the center point of the story. Je- the risen Jesus is walking alongside them, and what are they unable to do? Can they see him? Do they see Jesus? Yeah, they're going to start talking with him. Do they know that it's Jesus? So they can see, but they actually can't see. Do you get it? This is a, this is a powerful story. And, and it, this is one of the most beautiful artistically told stories in the New Testament about somebody who is walking alongside Jesus but cannot see him. So Jesus asks, this whole story is full of irony, right? Jesus asks, what you guys talking about? <laughs> and then they stop, right? And, and their face is downcast. And then a guy, we find out one of the names, Cleopas, said, are you the only one in Jerusalem? You have no clue what just happened over the weekend. You don't know what happened? And the irony is so thick, you can cut it with a knife, right? Of course, not only does Jesus know about what happened, he is what happened, right? And they don't know it. What things, Jesus asks? What? I don't know, what? Jesus of Nazareth. And, And then look at their depiction of him. Jesus of Nazareth. Listen, he was a prophet. He was powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. And the chief priests and our rulers, they killed him. They handed him over to be sentenced to death. He was crucified. And then, wait for it, here it is. We had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Let's just stop right there. So they've just showed their hand, right? So they don't know it, but you know it as the reader, and as Jesus is going to focus on, they they just exposed what what is blinding them. Do you see that for them, Jesus' crucifixion is not a victory? Do you see that? For for them, Jesus' crucifixion shattered everything that they hoped for. They thought Jesus was a prophet, that he was going to redeem Israel through his powerful words and deeds. And then the cross ends up being this tragic destruction of their hopes and everything that they thought. Nobody saw this coming. Even though Jesus tried to communicate it to them, it was so outside. The crucified Messiah was so outside of what they thought the Messiah was supposed to be. And here's a great example. Now, the language here is so loaded here. Because in reality, does Jesus think that he redeemed Israel by dying on the cross? Does Jesus think that? As we'll see, yes. So exactly the thing that they think makes Jesus a failure is in the story of the gospel the the thing that made Jesus the victorious Messiah. Why do they think that Jesus' death is his failure to redeem Israel? And so part of this we have to... Uh, do a little homework on this word, um, redemption, which is, I, you know, as good a religious word as you could ever want, you guys. Um, it's one of those, I think in our, col- I mean, we have m- movies named after the word, for, for goodness sakes, right? It's, it's kind of this, I don't know, what do you think redemption means? What comes to your mind when you hear the word redeem or redemption? You can redeem, I guess you can redeem like tickets or coupons or something like that down at Oaks Park, right? You play a bunch of skee-ball. You're one of those people, right? And you play a bunch of skee-ball, and then you redeem your tickets to get the teddy bear or whatever. 
that's going to fall apart in two weeks. So you can do that, right? That, we use the word redeem for that to like buy something. Uh, but more often that word redemption, it's this kind of broad word to talk about when something tragic or horrible or sad gets transformed into something good and beautiful. That's my read on how we use the word redemption. What do you guys think? Yeah, there you go. So whatever, pick the movie or book that has the word in the title. Um, so that word redemption, though, has a really, really specific meaning and origin in, in the Bible. Um, and this is a really fun trivia fact to know. Use it at a party this Friday night. I don't know. Um, where in the story of the Bible does the word redemption appear for the first time? In, if you start on page one, where will you first come across it? Do you have a hunch? What story? The book of Exodus. And this is right uh, before Moses uh, goes to Pharaoh, and you've seen the movie, Let My People Go, that whole business. So here's the, here's the first appearance of the word redemption in the Bible. The Lord said to Moses, I've heard the groaning of the Israelites, whom the Egyptians are enslaving, and I've remembered my covenant promise. So say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I'll be your God. The, the first time that the word redemption appears in the Bible, it's in a story about the liberation of slaves from oppression into the freedom of becoming God's people. That's what redemption means. It means God per does something to purchase and liberate slaves and then make them into his own free, liberated people. That's the meaning of the word redemption in the Bible. And so just map the story on. Here it is. If you know the story, ten plagues, Pharaoh gets tromped on and so on, parting the Red Seas. Um, so when, these, when two Jewish men have their hopes that there's going to be a Messiah in the first century who's going to redeem Israel, what, what does that mean? Because for these two, Jesus' death is a, is a tragic fate that means... He, Redemption is not going to happen, at least not through Jesus. What does it mean? Well, what's the Exodus story? I mean, uh, if, if, who, who are the Egyptians in the days of these two right here? Who's the oppressor of Israel in Jesus' day? So it's the Romans, the Romans. And who is the, who's Pharaoh in Jesus' day? This guy named Caesar Augustus. And then he has a crony. A uh, puppet guy in Jerusalem. What's his name? He had Jesus executed. <laughs> his name's Pilate. It's very clear. It's very, very clear how this story works. If there's a Messiah and he's going to redeem, pull an Exodus move here, then he's going to tromp on Pharaoh and destroy the Romans. That's how this story works. I mean, it was Passover weekend, for goodness sakes. <laughs> and what story does Passover retell every year? This story, the Exodus story. So I'm, I'm trying to, like, sympathize with these two for a minute. Like, really sympathize. You've grown up under the thumb of Roman oppression, and Jesus comes around saying the kingdom of God is here. It all leads up to a climactic weekend retelling the redemption story in Jerusalem, and then he's crucified. How do you feel about your life <laughs> if you're these two? Now, there's one more piece to this um, that when it was pointed out to me, it, it all, all the dots came together for this story right here. Where are these two going? They're, they're traveling away from Jerusalem. They've packed up, and they're going to what town again? Do you remember? Emmaus. Now, biblical authors, when they tell you stories, they're very sparing in detail. Very sparing. Um, they, they don't mention all kinds of things that we wish they did mention. For example, Jesus' physical appearance is never described anywhere in the Bible, which is why Warner Solomon could sell 500 million of those. <laughs> so, so when the biblical authors do give you what seems like random information, pay attention because it matters. They're telling it to you because it matters. 
So why, they're going to a town called Emmaus. Why does Luke tell you that? So to, in, in Luke's audience, this is, if I were to say, um, you know, my wife and I um, wanted to learn more about the history of the, of the U.S. and the World War, so we took a, a trip to, to uh, Pearl Harbor. That's all I have to say. We went to visit Pearl Harbor. And what story is immediately in your mind? Of course, the bombing of, of Pearl Harbor. Or you're doing a U.S. history tour. We went to Gettysburg. Why would somebody go to Gettysburg? Do you, you get the idea here? So when Luke says, yeah, there were two disciples of Jesus going to Emmaus. It's exactly, do you know Emmaus? You know the story. <laughs> Clearly you know the story. The famous battle of Emmaus. You don't know the story? Okay, well, you didn't grow up in first century Jewish culture. That's why. So if you did, you would know the story. And here it is. This is 150 years before Jesus. Um, it's not the Romans on the scene. It's uh, the, the Syrians. And uh, they're led uh, by a general named uh, Gorgias, we're going to see. And uh, there was a Jewish uprising against the Syrians um, led by a family known as the Hammer. The Hammers. Uh, or in Hebrew, the Maccabees. And a, one particular guy, Judah, or Judas Maccabee, uh, led uh, the Jewish... ...like this from earlier in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6. Here's something Jesus said one day. Luke says he was on a plane giving a, a teaching. and he, Jesus said, But I say to you who are listening, love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Whoever hits you on the cheek, offer him the other also. Whoever takes away your coat, don't withhold your shirt from him either. Give to any, everyone who asks of you. Whoever takes away what's yours, don't demand it back. Treat others the same way you want them to treat you. Now, if you love only those who love you, what credit is that to you? Everybody does that. Even sinners do that to those who love them. But love your enemies. And do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great. You will be sons of the Most High, for He is kind and to the ungrateful and to evil people. Now, um, I'm not here to defend Jesus, and this teaching of Jesus opens up a million cans of worms. I understand that. Uh, but I think that's precisely what Jesus meant to do when He said these words is open a million cans of worms. Uh, Jesus has a vision of what it means to be a human being who follows him and who lives, uh, lives under God's reign. That's a very different way of life uh, than most humans have ever dreamt of. Uh, Jesus has this idea that, that the way that evil is truly confronted and defeated is by doing good, by suffering sacrificial love. And Jesus, these weren't just words to Jesus. He said, this is how you live under God's reign, under God's kingdom. And he said that's what he was here to bring. And then he goes into Jerusalem and he walks his talk, doesn't he? I mean, Jesus actually believed that he would conquer and defeat evil by letting evil defeat him. Did Jesus believe that he was redeeming Israel when he was being crucified by the Romans? Yes, he did. And that's what he was trying to tell the disciples the night before that he got arrested, right? Because he said, listen, this is a, we're here for Passover. It's a Passover meal. And do you remember he takes the, he takes the cup and he breaks the bread and he, and he takes these symbols of the Exodus story, and he reshapes them around what he, what's going to happen. 
that they point to his broken body and to his, his shed blood. And Jesus did believe that he was going to accomplish and do Exodus, and he was going to do it not by becoming Moses, <laughs> who's going to trump on Pharaoh, he's going to do it by becoming the lamb, the lamb of the Passover meal. And if you, I don't care how long you've heard the story, right? Every time you hear it and you see what Jesus was actually saying, most of his followers, if we're honest with ourselves, go, what? Like, this doesn't make any sense at all. Um, this is about as crazy as saying something like, you know, if you really want to save your life, you'll lose it. And if you really want to be the most influential person around, you'll go to the bottom and become a slave to everyone. We kind of sanitize that verse by using the word servant, <laughs> but the word that Jesus used has all the connotations that our word has of that name, slave. Like Jesus had a totally upside down view of the world, that the ultimate way that God was going to confront and defeat evil was through the, the suffering death of the messianic servant king. Isaiah 53 Zechariah 11, Genesis 3, 15. That the, the, God's ultimate purpose was actually not to destroy his enemy, but to die for his enemy. And that's where this story has always been heading, according to Jesus. That, that in Jesus, God binds himself to the human condition. And that the, the death of Jesus is not a tragedy. It's actually the way that humanity is redeemed. It, it's by Jesus taking into himself all of the consequences of our selfishness and sin and the train wreck of human history, and he allows it to defeat him so that he can defeat it through his resurrection from the dead. Loving your enemies is really bad advice if Jesus didn't rise from the dead. Are you with me? Loving your enemies is horrible because your enemy will kill you and then you're just dead, and you lose. But in Jesus' view, loving your enemy is actually the only way to win. If your hope is in a God who himself overcame evil and death by conquering it with his love and resurrection life. Are you with me? If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, this is all a sham. You should go golfing and I'll go skateboarding right now. You know what I'm saying, right? It's ridiculous why we're here. But if Jesus did rise from the dead, then everything I thought I knew about the world, I have to rethink. And everything I thought I knew about myself, I have to rethink. Everything I thought I knew about God and Jesus, I have to, I have to let it be rebuilt by the resurrection. Now watch where this all goes. Even after the Bible study, they still don't see Jesus. So they finally get to Emmaus, where they're going. And Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. It's wonderful. <laughs> no, really, I have to go, you know, see a man about a horse or something. I don't know. All right. And then they urge him. They're like, no, come on, stay with us, have dinner. No, really, I need to be going. And oh, okay. All right. right? It's wonderful. So he goes in and they have dinner. Here it is. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread. He's being hosted by someone else, and, but he takes the lead. <laughs> he takes the bread. He gives thanks for it, he breaks it, and he gives it to them. Now just stop right there. He took the bread, he gives thanks for it, he breaks it and gives it to his disciples. Anybody? Come now. <laughs> Come now. Do, you, do you get it? All right, turn two pages backwards, and what we, you'll discover, the la when's the last time Jesus took bread, gave thanks for it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples? It's the Passover meal. That happened hours before he got arrested. He took the bread, he gave thanks for it, he broke it. The, the symbols that he gave his disciples to eat and internalize the story of his broken body and shed blood, he gives it to them, then their eyes were opened. Then they recognized him, and he disappears. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, oh my gosh. And then they go tell all of the others, and, and then Jesus appears later again. But uh, So let's just right there. We'll focus right there. It's, it's, only, it's only when a disciple of Jesus 
humbles themselves and, and checks all their baggage, checks everything they thought they knew about Jesus and the world and themselves, and they allow the scandal of the cross, the scandal of the crucified God, to come to us personally and give us himself. And precisely these, these sacred symbols, right? I mean, it's, what we, it's what we do at the culmination of every Sunday gathering is we take the bread and the cup. And it becomes such a ritual for us that we stop thinking about it. But this is the, this is the heartbeat of the whole story. It's God defeats evil and sin. God confronts his enemy by dying for his enemy. And that's so scandalous. It's so... <laughs> It's so scandalous. I mean, do I, do I even need to bring up the outpouring of hatred and vengeance that's happening right now in our culture towards our enemy? Who is our enemy? Go ask your neighbor who your enemy is. It's very clearly ISIS. And Paul the Apostle would say, fools, fools. ISIS is not our enemy. There is a deeper, more mysterious form of evil at work in humanity that has tricked us all into thinking that we win when we kill each other. And the, the scandal of the crucifixion of Jesus is, is telling us something about ourselves, something about God, Sorry, I wasn't going to bring up ISIS, but how can I not? Are you with me? Like, there's something so powerful about the crucifixion of Jesus. We, we assume that God is for us and against my enemy. And the story of the scriptures is exposing how, how shallow and superficial that thinking is, as if I am not the enemy. <laughs> we have met the enemy, says the story of the Bible, and, and it is us. And we're all contributors to why this world is the way that it is. And the good news that we come around in the bread and the cup is that God loves his enemy and that he will defeat evil and sin in our world precisely through suffering, self-giving love. Now, what that is supposed to look like on the ground in day-to-day -day life and in our politics, may God help us. <laughs> may God help us and guide us by his spirit as we figure that out one out, but we should have no mistake of who Jesus thinks the enemy is, and it's not another human. It's, it's an evil, a spiritual evil that lurks much deeper, and that's much darker, and that's in every single one of us. And, and so we come together to celebrate good news. The disciples of Jesus for 2,000 years have had this strange idea that when Jesus walked out of that tomb with a resurrection body, empowered and recreated by God's own life and love and spirit, and that that gives us, it's the prototype <laughs> of our hope for ourselves, for the universe, for those who will humble themselves before Jesus and, and follow him, we can look at the tragedies of the last few weeks, name them for what they are, they're evil and stubbornly believe there is still good news to, to be had in this world. Amen? That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. That's what it means to believe that, that the resurrection opened up a new day. A new day for humanity and a, a new day for my vision of myself. And so that's where I'm going to land uh, the plane as we come to take the bread and the cup today. Um, I don't know what your story is that you brought in today. I don't know what habits or, or patterns of behavior or ways of thinking that are at work in you. I'm not sure I even know what are the ones at work in me that, that blind me from seeing Jesus. Uh, but God have mercy on us. And uh, as we confess and we name our failures and we bring them to the bread and the cup today, may our eyes be opened to see who Jesus truly is. Amen.